Hello and welcome everyone. In this video, we are going to see the solutions of ISI entrance test. It has two parts. One of them is objective, which contains 30 objective questions, and another is subjective, which has eight subjective questions. So the objective portion is called UGA. It was held on 12th of May. Now, who is it useful for? Of course, the students who have taken the exam this year may want to look at the solutions. Not only that, if you are going to take JE, main advanced or any such exams next year and you are interested in maths then you uh, also should apply for isa entrance test and you can first try the questions on your own and then if you are not able to get it then you can look at the solution even the students who are gearing up for j advanced this year uh, can benefit from this because uh, it contains some really out of the box questions which will involve literal thinking and such questions are also as in J advanced, so you can say that yes, level of a lot of these questions is similar to that of J advanced. With that, let us have a look at the first question. So the question is: Let J be a number selected at random from one to two thousand twenty-four. What is the probability that J is divisible by nine and fifteen? It's an easy question. Okay, they are starting off with easy questions. Gradually, they will increase the level. Now, because the question is asked in the year 2024, they are using the number 2024. It's a common pattern in Olympiads and such exams. Now, what is the smallest number which is divisible by both 9 and 15? All of you know that that number is called LCM of these two numbers. So, LCM of 9 and 15 is... Is there a common factor? Yes, there is a common factor of 3. The highest power of 3 in any of these is 3 squared. And the power of 5 is 1. So, overall, the LCM will be 3 squared times 5 raised to the power 1. That is how much? 45. So, uh, we want to find the number of numbers divisible by 45 and up to 2024. So, if we divide 2024 divided by 45, first of all, it will be divided how many times? It will be divided 4 times and that will be how many? It will be uh, 180. The remainder is 2, 4 and 10 minus 8 is 2, 224. Uh, Again, if you see, it can be divided four times only. Uh, so, it will be again uh, 44. So, the answer should be, there are 44 numbers which are divisible by 2024, which are divisible by 45 up to 2024. So, the probability will simply be 44 divided by uh, 2024. If you calculate this, you will find that it's perfectly divisible. First, let me divide by 4. So, it is 11. And this is how much? Uh, this is 4, 5 is a 20, uh, 0. And uh, this is how much? 6. And if you divide by a 6, 11, 4 is a 44 and 11, 6 is a 66. So this is 1 by 46. Now in the hurry, uh, what are some stupid mistakes? One of the stupid mistakes could be that rather than saying that the, it is their LCM, you can directly multiply 15 and 9 and say all the results of 225. Now if you go during that path, Using that path, then you will find uh, 1 by 5, work 253, which is also there in the options. So they have kept the provision for even the faulty options. If you are a little bit non-cautious, then you can even get the wrong answer. So for this question, the answer is option number B, 1 by 46. I will rate it as easy question, especially uh, for an exam of this caliber. Moving on. Question number 2 is, let SN be the set of all n-digit numbers whose digits are all 1 or 2. And there are no consecutive twos. Okay. Now it is possible if only there are up to five twos. Because if you get more than five twos, then you can say that at least two will be consecutive. So let us make the cases. One of the cases could be that all tens are ones. Or we could have nine ones and one two. Or we could have eight ones and two twos. Seven ones and three twos. We could have six ones and how many twos? We could have four twos. Or we could have everything balanced five ones and five twos. Now, because all the twos need to be separate, they need to be non consecutive, they will be in the gaps of ones. Now, there's only one way to arrange all the ten ones, that is one way. How many ways are there of arranging, you know, nine ones and one two? You can say that it is, you just pick one place for two. And put it at 2 in one way. So this will be 10 ways. Now first uh, you have to put 
eight ones and then two twos in the gaps of those eight ones. So eight ones, well, they are identical. They can only be arranged in one way. How many gaps will there be in uh, eight ones? Let me mark the eight ones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, if you look at the gaps, there are nine gaps between these eight twos. Uh, between these eight ones so and out of these nine gaps you have to choose two gaps for putting two two so the answer will be nine c2 for this one this will be how much uh, nine into four is 36 similarly between seven ones there will be eight gaps out of those eight gaps you have to choose three gaps which can be done in eight into seven into six by six that is 56 ways then you can put six ones and between them there will be seven gaps out of those seven gaps you can choose four gaps in seven c4 manner it will be uh, 35 ways and finally in the five ones there will be six gaps among those six gaps you can choose five and 65 ways that is six and you if you add all of these you will get 36 6 plus 6 12 uh, 12 plus 1 13 13 plus 5 18 plus 6 24 carry 2 2 plus 1 3 plus 3 6 plus 5 11 12 13 14 144 which is my option number c now there was a little bit of counting involved in this so you can see the level of this question was moderate not too tough not too easy either it was you had to, if you are perfect uh, you know on point with your casework then you'll get the correct answer and the answers are far apart so there is no scope for calculation error also in this one the next one is if t be a right angle triangle in the plane whose side lengths are in geometric progression so suppose the sides are a AR and AR square. Now, ideally, you can choose them to be uh, A by R, A and AR also. It's perfectly all right if you choose in either. And let, because it's a right angle triangle also, it will follow the Pythagoras theorem, which is largest side square. Suppose my R is greater than 1, then the largest side will be AR square. The whole square will be equals to A square plus AR the whole square using Pythagoras theorem. We can cancel one of the uh, a squares and what will remain is a quadratic equation in r square which will be r power 4 minus r square minus 1 equals to 0. We can found, find its roots pretty well. Its roots will be that my r square is equals to 1 plus minus root of 1 plus 4 divided by 2. Now, of course, r square cannot be negative, so we are only going to consider the positive root and just ignore the negative root from here on. So we can write it as root 5 plus 1 by 2 is the r square. Then my r will be square root of square root of 5 plus 1 by 2. Now, because the side lengths are integer, okay, then a must be an integer, right? And if a is an integer, then out of r and r square, how many of them can be integer? Well, because r is an irrational number and so is r square you know that at max one of them can be integers so maximum value of nt uh, so we are going to consider the possibility that is it possible that two of these could be integer let us suppose my a is a non-integer suppose my a is something like root 5 minus 1 by 2 under root because i want to i'm trying to make a conjugate kind of thing with this r so what will be my ar ar will be root of 5 minus 1 divided by and 2 to the 4 will be there. AR will be 1. But then what will be AR square? AR square will again be. If you multiply this by R, you will get root of root 5 plus 1 by 2. So whatever you do, you are not going to get more than one integer side. It could be the smallest side. It could be the intermediate side. Uh, but you cannot have more than one integer side. So maximum value of number of integer lengths in this right angle triangle could be 1. So the answer is option number B. This was slightly tricky to think about, you know, till solving this part was easy that r equals to root of root of 5 plus 1 by 2. But after it, to think that there cannot be more than one integer length uh, will take some convincing and some time. Alright, now this one is a uh, tricky and easy at the same time. So, if you just try to simplify this expression, 1 plus 1 by x, this is how much? This is actually x plus 1 divided by x. So let me write the whole of x plus 1. It will be, uh, you know what, let me write as 1 plus x divided by x. So it is 1 plus 1 plus 2 power 1 by 5 plus 4 I can write as 2 power 2 by 5. 8 I can write as 2 power 3 by 5 and 16 I can write as 2 power 4 by 5. And in the denominator we just have what? We just have 1 plus 2 power 1 by 5 
plus 2 power 2 by 5 plus 2 power 3 by 5 plus 2 power 4 by 5. What you observe here is that this 1 plus 1 becomes 2 and this 2 in a way is 2 raised to the power 5 by 5. So in all of the terms in the numerator, I can practically take a 2 raised to the power 1 by 5 common and what will remain is exactly x. What I am going to do is I am going to do it in two steps. First, let me write the numerator rearranged. You let us write the 2 raised to the power 1 by 5 first because I want to write them in increasing order then 2 power 2 by 5. 2 power 3 by 5 plus 2 power 4 by 5 plus 2 power 1 which is practically 5 by 5 and whole divided by it is 1 plus so I brought this 1 plus 1 on the other side in the denominator is 1 plus 2 power 1 by 5 plus 2 power 2 by 5 plus 2 power 3 by 5 plus 2 power 4 by 5. You can observe that if you just take 2 power 1 by 5 common in the numerator the remaining part will be exactly the denominator. So this ratio is nothing but 2 power 1 by 5. If you wish you can observe that if you divide you will get 1 plus 2 power 1 by 5 plus 2 power 2 by 5 plus 2 power 3 by 5 plus 2 power 4 by 5. Which is exactly what is there in the denominator. This is my whole x. So x gets cancelled with x. This whole expression is just 2 power 1 by 5. And now we want to know the 2 power 1 by 5 whole power 30 is just 2 power 6 and its value is 64 which is my option number B. Now if it clicks it clicks then it's an easy question but if it doesn't click it's possible that you may go off in tangent directions and not come up with the correct answer. Alright again I would rate it as an easy question with a star mark that is if it doesn't click then it may be a tough question also. Alright next is a again a probability question says that there are 30 true or false questions in an exam. Uh, a student knows how to answer 20 questions and guesses the answer to the remaining 10 questions at random. What is the probability that the student gets exactly 24 answers correct? So the game is uh, for the remaining 10 questions only because for the 20 questions he precisely knows the answer. So the probability of getting them is correct is 1. So in the remaining 10 questions, suppose he chose precisely uh, 6 precisely 4 questions correctly because 24 among the 20 known questions and 4 correct among the remaining 10 questions. So that he can do is in 10 C 4 ways and he can answer them correctly because this is true for questions in 1 by 2 power 4 ways and the remaining questions he will attempt incorrectly in 1 by 2 power 6 ways. So this is a question of binomial distribution. This is a simple and direct question of binomial distribution. And in this, if we just calculate this, this will be 10 into 9 into 8 into 7 divided by 4 into 3 into 2 into 1 into 1 by 2 raised to the power 10. We can cancel this 8, we can cancel this 3, we can cancel one more 2's in the numerator. What will remain is uh, 5 3's are 15 and 15 to 5 is 105 and in the denominator what will remain is 2 power 9. That's just my option number A. And I would rate it an easy question, probably one of the easiest questions in this paper. So you see first five questions were easy, one of them could be moderate, but let us see what is the next question like. Now suppose Z1 and Z2 are uh, located on the circles mod of Z equals to 2 and mod of Z equals to 3 respectively. If you see they are a unit circle, uh, sorry, circle centered at origin, one of them has radius 2 and another has radius 3. So let me draw two such circles. So suppose there is a circle with radius 2, the smaller one, and this is a circle with radius 3. And now let us draw two points. The angle included between the vectors is 60 degrees. So let me say one of these vectors is Z1 and another vector is Z2. Okay, Z1, this is Z2 and the angle between them is theta is equals to 60, which I am going to write as pi by 3 in terms of radius. So suppose my Z1 is a complex number in polar form written as 2 e raised to the power iota uh, alpha. Let me write the term alpha here. Then my Z2 using rotation will be uh, Z2 will be equals to 3 times e raised to the power iota alpha plus pi by 3. And my Z1 I have assumed as 2 e raised to the power iota alpha in polar form. So if I substitute these values of Z1 and Z2 in here. I will get mod of z1 plus z2 divided by mod of z1 minus z2 is uh, mod of 2 e raised to the power i alpha 
plus 3 e raised to the power iota alpha into e raised to the power iota pi beta. I can write it like this. Whole divided by in the denominator, we have mod of 2 e raised to the power iota alpha minus 3 e raised to the power iota alpha into e raised to the power iota pi by 3. But you will notice that this whole e raised to the power iota alpha will get cancelled in this whole expression. And what will remain in the numerator is 2 plus 3 times e raised to the power iota pi by 3 can be written as cos pi by 3 plus iota sin pi by 3, which is actually half plus iota root 3 by 2. And the denominator will be my 2 minus 3 times again half plus iota root 3 by 2. Now what I can do is I can directly find the magnitude or modulus of numerator and divided by modulus of denominator. So this will be 2 plus 3 by 2, which is 7 by 2, the whole square. And plus, it will be uh, 27 by 2. Whole divide by, in the denominator, what will we have is 2 to the 4 minus 3, that is 1 by 2, the whole square, that is 1 by 4. Plus again, 27 by 4. This by 4, by 4 will cancel everywhere. In the numerator, we have 49 plus 27, which is how much? Root of 76 divided by root of 27 plus 1 is 28. We can cancel a 4 again and what will remain is root of 19 by 7, which is very much there, the first option. Alright everyone, let's keep moving. Next is the angle subtended at the origin by the common chord of these two circles. By the way, how do we find the common chord of two circles? You just subtract their equations. You say S1 minus S2 equals to 0 will be either the radical axis or the common chord. In this case, because these are intersecting circles, the radical axis will coincide with the common chord. And the equation will turn out to be minus 6x minus 6y plus 36 equals to 0. So this is just the straight line x plus y equals to 6. Now what about the endpoints? By endpoints I mean where does it cut these two circles? So if you just see that the circle x square plus y square equals to 36 is centered at origin. So it will cut the x-axis at 6, 0, minus 6, 0 and cut the y-axis at 0, 6 and 0, minus 6. See this point is 6, 0. This point is 0, 6 and the common chord coincidentally is just the line joining these two points A and B. Now the good news is we know very well that what angle does this chord AB subtend at the origin. This angle is just pi by 2 as we know it because uh, the angle subtended is nothing but made up of the x-axis and the y-axis and the angle between x and y-axis is right angle. So the answer is pi by 2. Again, easy question. So far we are dealing with the easier side questions. Next one is the precise interval on which the function is monotonically decreasing is. So let us talk about each of these functions. Okay, and even before that, let us define the domain. Domain will be when the everything inside log, the argument of log is positive. So we want x square minus 2x minus 3 is greater than 0. We are defining the domain first. Now if we factorize this, it will be x minus 3 times x plus 1 is greater than 0. So the domain is actually x belongs to minus infinity to minus 1 open union 3 open to infinity. Now knowing that the vertex of this quadratic is at x equals to 1 and it's an upward parabola. So towards the right of 1 the graph is increasing. So from 3 to infinity the graph is decreasing. And from minus infinity to minus 1 the graph is decreasing. What about the graph of log of x base half? Because the base is less than 1 we know that the graph of this log will be decreasing. And we know very well about composition of increasing and decreasing graphs. So we want the overall function to be decreasing. So if my inside function is increasing and outside function is decreasing, then the overall function will be decreasing. So we want the inside function to be increasing and that is happening in the interval 3 to infinity. So I can comfortably say that the answer is directly 3 to infinity. This is a very nice graphical way of solving it and knowing the properties of composite function and their nature. So if you were to go after derivative, that let's find derivative and then let us find which are the intervals of monotonically increasing or decreasing, you will have a tougher time. And you don't need to do, do that frankly in this question. This is the best way of solving this. Alright, next question is because x1 to xn are given as non-negative real numbers and your summation is 1, then what is the maximum possible value of summation of root of xi? Because my xi's are squares of root of xi's, the inequality that can be useful is rms is greater than or equals to am. rms 
I greater than equals to m. I am applying on which numbers? I am applying it on root of x i. So let me write a m first. A m will be root of x one plus root of x two and so on till root of x n whole divided by how many numbers are these? These are n numbers. This will be on the other side. We will have the squares. The square will be nothing but x one plus x two plus x three and so on till x n whole divided by n. We have been given summation of x i as one. So what we have is simply root of one by n. Is greater than equals to sigma root of x i, where i belongs from one to n whole divided by n. So my root of x i sigma i equals to one to n will be less than equals to n by root of n will be root of n actually. So its maximum value, maximum possible value can be root of n. And you know when does the equality occur in RMS greater than m equality? When all the participating numbers are equal. Now this is one way of solving this question. Another way I'm not solving it using that method, but I'm just showing you out that you can even solve this using something called Cauchy or Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Okay. So uh, you know a lot of inequalities are interconnected. One of them can be proved using another. So it's okay if you you have used any other inequality to reach to the same conclusion. Again, it's a Direct question or direct application of this inequality. All right. Next, we have a good question. This question says that in triangle ABC, CD is the median. Median means these two sides, the side BD and AD, are going to be equal. And BE is the altitude. Means this angle is a right angle. This angle is a right angle. Given that my side CD is equals to BE, then what is the value of angle ACD? When you think about it, uh, there are two ways of solving this question. One is the objective approach, because they haven't mentioned anything about the triangle ABC. Uh, let us consider a special case, and that special case could be that suppose it's an equilateral triangle, and if it is an equilateral triangle, then you know that the medians and the altitudes and the angle bisectors and the perpendicular bisectors all will coincide. And you know the thing about the angles of an equilateral triangle; they are all 60 degrees. And this angle, which they want to know, the triangle, the angle ACD. Will be just half of 60 degrees, uh, which will be 30 degrees. So this angle will be 30 degrees for a particular triangle, uh, equilateral triangle, and that is there in the options also. The answer must be pi by 6. Okay, that is an objective approach, uh, and there is no reason that uh, because uh, it's true for an equilateral triangle. Uh, but ideal is suppose it was a subjective exam where you had to write solution, then you had to prove. That this is true for any general triangle and not just equilateral triangle. So let us do that precisely. Now in the next method, we are not going to have any presumption and let's solve it properly. Now let us take this angle A. You know what? This angle A is common to both the triangles B E A and the triangles B C A. And because we know the two sides are equal in these, and also we know one of these angles, which is right angle in this triangle, and then we can use the sine rule in these two triangles. So first, let me apply the sine rule. In which triangle? Let me apply the sine rule in the triangle BEA for the two known angles. One of the known angles is sine of E, which is 90 degrees. Sine of 90 degrees divided by AB is equals to the other angle will be uh, sine of A whole divided by what is the other side? BE. All right. And anything else in common among these? Well, we know the thing about AB. AB is nothing but two times AD. So we can simplify it at the, sine 90 is one. One divided by AB is two times AD. And on the other side, we have sine of A divided by B. Let me write it as equation number one. Let us apply now such sine rule in the triangle CDA. If we do that, we have how much? Sine of A divided by CD. And on the other hand side, we have. Let us take this angle, desired angle, sine of ACD. Sine of angle ACD, whole divided by the side opposite to this is AD. Now what we can do is from the first equation we can write AD as 2 BE upon sine A. So I will get a relation between sine of angle ACD. So my sine of A divided by CD is how much? Sine of A uh, divided by CD, which is the same as BE. All right, sine of this is same as BE, and on the other hand side we have sine of angle ACD whole divided by two BE upon sine of. 
you will see this sin A will cancel with this sin A, this B A will cancel with this B E. And actually my A D will be equals to not 2 B E but divided by sin A, but it will be B by 2 sin A. So if you consider B by 2 sin A, this 2 will go in the numerator. So I have sin of angle A C D is equals to half. That means my angle A C D must be equals to how much? Either pi by 6 or 5 pi by 6, but looking at this, this diagram, this angle C is more than that, okay. So it definitely will not be more than pi. So this is looking like an acute angle. So we can safely say that this triangle, this angle ACD will be pi by 6. So that is our general proof. So let's continue. And the next question is, the number of elements in the set X such that X belongs to 0 to 2 closed. And mod of x minus x power 5 equals to mod of x power 5 minus x power 6. So what are the number of elements in this set? Now any logical person will first try to factorize this and see what is the conclusion. So one of the conclusion is that if you take an x common what will remain is 1 minus x power 4 in the left hand side. And on the right hand side if you take x power 5 common what will remain is simply 1 by x. Now acknowledging that x equals to 0 could be one of the roots. Let us cancel this factor of x and let us factorize further. The factors of left hand side after this will be 1 minus x times and this can be written as 1 plus x plus x square plus x cube. And on the right hand side what we will have is uh, mod of x power 4 times 1 minus x. Again acknowledging that x equals to 1 could be another factor. We can cancel this factor. And the remaining terms in 0 to 2 can directly be opened with a plus sign. So what we have is x power 4 is equals to x cube plus x square plus x plus 1. Now we, what we want to do is find the point of intersection of these two graphs. So you roughly know the graph of x power 4. The graph of x power 4 is, uh, you know, it will have a minima at 0. It will be similar to quadratic, just more sharper. It will, by sharper, I mean it will increase pretty quickly, decrease pretty quickly, and then increase pretty quickly from here. And the another graph is x cubed plus x square plus x plus 1. It's a cubic graph. Suppose if I consider it as fx, consider it as gx. And if I uh, differentiate g dash x, it will be 3x square plus 2x plus 1. You will find it's always greater than 0. For all x belongs to real number, that means it's a strictly increasing function. And uh, as far as the point of infection is concerned, if you find g double dash x, it will be 6x plus 2 equals to 0. So x equals to minus 1 by 3 will be a point of infection. And its value at 0 is 1. Its value at 0 is 0. You will find that uh, towards the left hand side, towards the left hand side of this, uh, 1, it will cut the graph once, definitely because it is coming from now towards the right hand side, it will cut the graph once more. Okay. Now whether that point is beyond 2 or before 2, for that we can define a new function called hx is equals to fx minus gx. So suppose we have x power 4 minus x cube minus x square minus x minus 1. Now if I calculate f of 0, h of 0 is minus 1 and if I calculate h of 1, it is still uh, minus 3 which is a negative quantity but if I calculate h of 2, h of 2 if you calculate it will be 16 minus 2 to the 4 to the 8 minus 4 minus 2 minus 1. This is plus 1 and you know that it's a continuous function because it's a polynomial function. So while going from 1 to 2, it is changing its sign from negative to positive means using intermediate value theorem. You know that it's a continuous function. So using IMBT, it will have one more root alpha belonging to 1 open to 2 open. Now where will that be? I am not precisely pinpointing it but looking at the shape of these graphs it will have one more root between 1 to 2 and what were the three roots then? One of the roots is 0, one of the roots is 1 and one of the root will lie between 1 to 2. Which one? I am not saying which one but there will guaranteedly be one more root between 1 and 2 so it has overall three solutions. Now alternatively what you can do is rather than uh, you know factorizing so much you can directly Factorize only a factor of x and then uh, the left hand side will open as 1 minus x power 4. That is if x is less than 1 and the right hand side will open as x power 4 minus x power 5. And if uh, it's 
X is greater than one, then both of them will open uh, in an alternative manner, where the left hand side will open with x power four minus one, and right hand side will open with a x power five minus x power four. Now, in any case, this equation is slightly simpler. You can assume the function f x says if we bring everything on the left hand side, then x power five minus two x power four plus one. And seeing the maximum and minimum of this function is very easy. So you find f dash x is five x power four. Minus four to the eight x cube equals to zero. So x is equals to eight by five. Turns out to be a point of. Now towards the left it is uh, decreasing. Towards the right it is increasing. So it's a point of minima. So eight by five is a point of minima. So uh, towards the right of this the function will be increasing. Towards the left function will be decreasing. And if you find the value of the function at one again it is zero. If you find the value of the function at one, it is zero. Until eight by five, it is decreasing only. So we can say that between one and eight by five, it is going below the x-axis, and after that, it will start coming above the x-axis. And at two again, you can find its value is again positive one. This curve passes through two comma one, and this point is one comma zero. This point is eight by five comma something negative quantity. So again, we can say that that root. Will lie precisely between the interval 8 by 5 to 2 alpha. If I be more precise, will lie between 8 by 5 open to 2 open. Okay. So, and this is a clear-cut proof that it will have only three solutions. Next is let n greater than equals to 1. Then the maximum number of possible primes in this set is now because smallest possible value of n is 1. Why don't we take the example of n equals to 1? Then n plus Let n equals to one. Then n plus one will be equals to one plus six. That is seven. And if I write all the numbers from seven, okay, eight and so on, till how many numbers are these? The numbers uh, from n plus six to n plus thirty-five. There are thirty numbers. So the the last number will be thirty-six. If you count these, these are some thirty-six numbers. Uh, thirty numbers. Now, which are all the prime numbers from seven to thirty-six? You count just the prime numbers. It will be seven, eleven, thirteen, seventeen, nineteen, twenty-three, twenty-nine, thirty-one, and that's it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These are the eight primes between seven to thirty-six. And you know that primes get rarer and rarer as we move up in the line using prime number theorem. Uh, and If you want to find similar examples, you can take some higher values of n, but you will never reach up to 12. 12 is impossible. How can we prove it? We know that any prime number greater than 2 or 3 will be of the form either 6n or 6n plus minus 1, right? So you can say that between any uh, six consecutive numbers, uh, you cannot have. Uh, and if it is an odd prime, because they are odd also, then 6n is also out of the picture. We can say that all the remaining primes are of the form 6n plus minus 1. So among any six consecutive numbers, there can be at most two primes. So because there are 30 such numbers, and these are like five, uh, you know, five times six, and in each six there can be, cannot be more than two. So it cannot have five into two. That is 10 primes. So we got an example with eight primes. We know very well using this theorem that we cannot have more than 10 primes. So the answer must be eight. This is an objective proof. The proving that it actually has exactly uh, it can never have more than eight primes might take some effort, but we definitely prove that it cannot have more than ten primes. All right. Next is a PNC uh, based question. It says that there are 40 distinguishable or different balls, which are to be distributed among four different boxes such that each box get exactly ten balls. Now, out of the 40 balls, 10 are defective, and 30 are non-defective. In other ways, can we? Distribute the balls such that the defective balls, uh, all the defective balls go to the first two boxes. So suppose this is box one, box two, box three, box four. So uh, let me do one thing. Let me choose uh, 20 non-defective balls and let us fill box three and box four with those. Now, in how many ways can I choose 20 non-defective balls out of 30 non-defective balls? We can do it in 30 c 20 ways, and we can distribute them in these two groups in 20 factorial, divide by 10 factorial whole square by two factorial ways, and we can distribute them among among b3 and b4 in two factorial ways. And the remaining 20 balls can go in b1 and b2 in 20 factorial by 10 factorial the whole square two factorial into two factorial number of ways. This is a standard question of grouping. 
Now, if I expand this 30 C20, this is 30 factorial. By 20 factorial by 10 factorial, overall these two gets cancelled, these two can cancel. What we have is 20 factorial whole square by 10 factorial power 4. If we cancel one of the 20 factorials and combine the powers of 10 factorial in the denominator, we will get 30 factorial times 20 factorial in the numerator. And in the denominator, we will get 10 factorial power 5, which is my option number. The next question we have to find the number of positive solutions to the inequality e raised to the power x sin x is equal to log x plus e raised to the power x plus 2. Now all of us know the graph of e raised to the power x times sin x. Its range will be from all the numbers from negative infinity to plus infinity. What we do is we draw the graph of e raised to the power x. We draw the graph of minus of e raised to the power x. And you know that sin x will oscillate between minus 1 and 1. So the actual graph of e raised to the power x will, uh, you know, keep on increasing its amplitude. So at 0, it will be 0. But then when will it become 1 again? At pi by 2, it will become e raised to the power pi by 2. At 3 pi by 2, what will happen is, this will become minus 1. So it will become e raised to the minus of e raised to the power minus 3 pi by 2. Uh, sorry, minus of e raised to the power 3 pi by 2. Then it will become plus e raised to the power 5 by 2, then minus e raised to the power 7 5 by 2 and so on. So that's how it will keep on increasing its amplitude. As far as the other graph is concerned, we have to notice that towards infinity, this e raised to the power x will dominate. Let us forget about the sin x as of now because these peaks we know at least are at the higher side of e raised to the power x. And at infinity, e raised to the power x will dominate e raised to the power root x plus log x plus 2 for several regions. One of the regions is that if you assume e raised to the power root x as t, then e raised to the power x is t square. And you know that near infinity t square will be larger than larger than t. Second of all, log x is less than x, which in turn is less than e power x. And again, the difference is huge. So you can say that this will itself be greater than 1. And this is just a small constant. So near very large x, my e raised to the power x will definitely dominate. If this will dominate means the graph, the right hand side graph, doesn't matter whether it oscillates or not, will remain below these peaks at least. It will remain below these peaks. That means we will always keep on getting, suppose this graph oscillates somewhat, but it will always remain below this graph of e raised to the power x. So they will keep on meeting infinitely many times. Okay, if you find want to find the nature though, then this derivative of right hand side is f dash x is equal to 1 by x plus 1 by 2 root x e raised to the power root x and the good news is for positive x this is greater than 0. So it won't even oscillate, it will be a strictly increasing function. So it is a strictly increasing function which will remain below this function by and large, at least the peaks of this function so we can say that they will keep on meeting indefinitely at infinitely many. So to analyze this is critical that e raised to the power x is greater than log x and e raised to the power x is greater than root x and even their sum. How come their sum? Well, at best it can be t and this, I can say that e raised to the power x will even be greater than log x. So if this is t and this is at max t, then this t square will still be greater than 2t. So there's no reason why this graph will go any lower. This will go lower and higher, but it will keep on oscillating between these peaks and troughs. So number of solutions ultimately are infinitely All right, next is in a room with n greater than or equals to two people, each pair shakes hands between themselves with probability two by n square. And independently of all the other pairs, if pn is the probability that total number of handshakes is at most one. If number of handshakes is at most one, it can be either exactly one or exactly zero. Exactly one handshake or you can say zero handshake. Now, how many pairs are these? Uh, in n, in how many ways can you choose two people out of n people? That can be done in nc2 ways. nc2, if you simplify, can be written as n into n minus 1 by 2. Now, if there is no handshake, then you know that uh, for each of these, the probability of shaking the hand is 2 by n square, then probability of not shaking hand is 1 minus 2 by n square. So, if zero handshakes are there, means each of these pairs are not shaking hands, and independently that will come out to be 1 minus 2 by n square whole power n into n minus 1 by 2. And exactly one handshake, what we can do is we can choose any one of these 
uh, n into n minus 1 by 2 pairs that can be done in n into n minus 1 by 2 ways. And then uh, they will shake hand in 2 by n square ways and the remaining person will not shake hand in 1 minus 2 by n square whole power n into n minus 1 by 2 minus 1 number of ways. And the overall probability will be the addition of these. So what I have to find is limit n tend to infinity limit n tend to infinity. I can take uh, this part common actually 1 minus 2 by n square whole power this whole part is n square minus n minus 2 whole divided by 2 common what will remain from the first bracket is 1 minus 2 by n square and what will remain from the second bracket is plus n into n minus 1 by 2 times 2 by n square. Now limit n tend to infinity, what are each of these limits? This limit is going to 0, this limit is becoming half and this is 1 plus, sorry it is 1 plus 1 that is 2, this whole thing is becoming 1 and this is 1 raised to the power infinity in determinate form which we know how to solve, this will be nothing but, well this is 1 plus 1, 2 and 2 times e raised to the power limit n tends to infinity, this will be n square minus n minus 2 whole divided by 2 times 1 minus 2 by n square minus 1. This minus 1 and minus 1 will cancel. This 2 and 2 will cancel. Overall you can see that limit n tends to infinity n square minus n minus 2 upon minus n square is minus 1. So this limit is 2 times c raised to the power minus 1 which is my option number D. Next is let P equals to x and y is such that we have these three different lines. Let us forget about inequality ones. Let me just draw all the three lines and their points of intersection. One of them is fairly straightforward. x plus 1 is greater than y. That means y equals to x plus 1, slope 1, y intercept 1. It's going to be this line. Slope 1, y intercept 1 is simply this line. It passes to one co uh, minus 1, comma 0 and 0, comma 1. Next is x equals to minus 1. x equals to minus 1 will be this line. And you can see that point of intersection of first two lines is minus 1 comma 0. As far as the third line is concerned y equals to 2x. It will cut this line at suppose x is minus 1 then y will be minus 2. So it will cut it minus 1 comma minus 2. It will also pass through origin and after passing through origin it will cut the other line at what point? It will cut the other line. Uh, suppose y equals to 2x if I put it in here then x plus 1 is equal to 2x. So here you will get x equals to 1 and if you put x equals to 1 you will get y equals to 2. So this point is 1 comma 2. This point is 1 comma 2. This point is minus 1 comma minus 2 and this point is minus 1 comma 0. Now let us consider the inequalities. If I look at this inequality x plus 1 is greater than or equals to y. If I see 0 comma 0 it satisfies this inequality. So it will be towards the origin. Towards the origin. If I talk about x is greater than minus 1 it is towards the right hand side of this line. And if I talk about y is greater than 2x, it will happen towards this side of this line. So it is this region basically. Now we have to, uh, you know, minimize this expression f of x comma y as x plus y. You know that it's a linear expression of x and y. So according to linear programming problems, the minima will occur at one of these three points. It is very much clear that when x and y both are negative, then the minima will occur. So its minimum value will occur at one of these endpoints of this polygon this convex polygon which will be minus 1 minus 2 which is minus 3. So the minimum value of this expression is minus 3. Alright, next is a very interesting question. It says that let n greater than 1 be the smallest composite integer that is co prime to 10,000 factorial by 9,900 factorial. So if we calculate this number, all the factors till 9,900 will cancel and what will remain is 10,000 times 9999 times 9998 and so on last couple of digits will be 999 uh, 999 9902 9901 and that's it. It will be product of these 100 numbers. Now you should know that any 100 consecutive integers and their product will be divisible by all the numbers from 1 to 100. So we can say that it will be divisible by 100 factorial. Divisible by 100 factorial means it will be divisible by each and every prime lesser than 100. So there is no question of being co-prime with any of these primes below 100. So it, if at all it has to have any prime uh, numbers with which it is co-prime, 
they need to be primes greater than 100 and what are the primes greater than 100 one of the smallest one is 101 then the next is 103 but let us check if this is co-prime with any of these numbers if i divide 9901 with 101 what is the remainder it will be divided nine times so this is 909 and what remains is mm, 10 minus 9 is 1 and 811 and how many times will it divide it will divide eight times so it will become 808 what will remain as remainder is 11 minus 8 is 3. So, uh, if you divide 9901 by 101, it will leave a remainder of 3. That means my 9901 plus 3 will be divisible by 101. So, even this number is not co-prime with 101. Okay? But if you keep going like this, we will find large enough numbers which it, will, it is co-prime with. But one thing is sure about them. What is sure about them? That it will be either a product of uh, two primes, it will be product of two primes, both greater than one. It will be, suppose there is a smallest composite number that is co-prime two, product of these hundred numbers. Suppose it is a uh, product of two primes. Now why product of two primes? It could be P1 square also, but in any case, suppose even if it is like P1 square, then all of those PIs are greater than hundred. And if PI is greater than hundred, then either P1 square will also be greater than 10,000 or my P1 into P2 will also be greater than 10,000. So uh, the smallest composite integer that is co-prime to this will be definitely greater than 10,000. There is no way it could be less than 10,000. All right. Next is an easy question. Suppose first of all, we let mod of X2 be T. Then the inequality in T is T square minus T minus 2. Whole divided by, let me take a minus common, minus t square plus 2t minus 2, minus 2 is greater than 0. What we have in the numerator is t square minus t minus 2, plus 2t square, minus 2 to the 4t plus 2 to the 4, whole divided by, if we take a minus common, what remains is t square minus 2t plus 2 is greater than 0. Let me send this minus sign on the other side and the remaining expression in the denominator is always positive. So we will only concern ourselves with the numerator which is 3t square minus 5t plus 2 is greater than 0. This inequality is very pretty simple. Spectres will be 3t square minus 3t minus 2t plus 2 is greater than 0. Or 3t minus 2 times t minus 1 is greater than 0. So we can say that t uh, belongs to minus infinity. Now one thing I forgot is that if I send the minus sign on the other side, then it will become less than zero, less than zero. This will also become less than zero. And then the solution uh, will become t belongs to two by three open to one. Open. What was my t again? t was mod of x. So mod of x belongs to, we can say it is uh, greater than equals to two by three and less than equals to one. Not equal to, greater than two by three, less than one. So we can say that ultimately x will belong from minus one open to minus two by three open union 2 by 3 open to 1 open which is option numbers among the some of the better class of questions previously we turn came across an easy algebraic question direct question all right next is an interesting question they are saying that let a equals to 1 to 5 and b equals to 1 to 10 the number of ordered pairs f and g of functions from a to b such that g of f of a is equals to a for all a belongs to let me do one thing. Let me mark the set A first, and then set B, then set A. Suppose this is my function f and this is my function g. Then overall uh, g or f will be this composite function from A to A. All right, mark A is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. B is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And my A is again 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, because we want g of f of a equals to a, you know that this domain is also set a and codomain is also set a. And for all a belongs to it should happen. So 1 should be, have 1 as output, 2 should have 2 as output, 3 should have 3 as output, 4 must have 4 as output and 5 must have 5 as output. But our intermediate part will take. Suppose 1 goes to 3, then 4 must go to 1. That means you sense one thing that if f is any function then g must be the inverse of that function at least for these five elements with respect to these five elements so suppose if one goes to four two goes to one then one should go to two suppose three goes to eight then eight should go to three 
Suppose 4 goes to 10, then 10 should go to 4. And suppose if 5 goes to 5, then 5 should go to 5. And in how many ways can you define these functions? Uh, 10p 5 ways. Because how many choices do you have for the first element? 10 choices for second. 9, then 8, then 7, then 6. So 10p 5 choices. Okay, why can't it be many one? Suppose it is a many one function. Then uh, the range of this function will never be will never take all these five elements, at least with respect to these five elements. So this condition will not be satisfied for at least one of the elements. Suppose both of them, uh, four and five went to 10, but then 10 can only output as one element. So one of these elements will be left out. We don't want that. Okay, and it will, it will not go to itself also. And because we cannot have uh, two arrows coming out of a single uh, element in a function, otherwise that won't be a function at all. It could be a relation, but not a function. So that is with respect to the, these points. Now, whichever are the remaining points, suppose 2, 3, 6, 7, and 9, they can be outputted to any of the remaining 5 values. So for the remaining 5, we have 5 raised to the power 5 first. Now, how can you write this element? You can write as 10 factorial by 5 factorial into 5 raised to the power 5, which is my option number 8. All right. In other words, you can also write it 10p 5 into 5 raised to the power 5. All right, next is a standard question. There are a couple of ways of doing it. One of them is uh, imagining that this is 100 and this is 400. Okay, 1 by 10, root of 10,000 is 1 by 100. This is 1 by 400. So if we try to find the upper limit of S, let us take all the perfect square from 100 to 101. And we can say that uh, this sum will be less than equals to how is it 101 square minus 100 squares divided by 100 plus 102 square minus 101 whole square divided by 101. And if you keep going like this, ultimately it will be plus uh, 400 whole square minus 399 whole square divided by 399. It will be greater than or equals to. 101 whole square minus 100 whole square divided by 101 plus 102 whole square minus 101 whole square divided by 102 and ultimately 400 square minus 399 whole square divided by 400. If you look at all the terms in the numerator, their difference is 1 and sum is 201. So difference is constant 1. So this is nothing but 201 by 100 plus uh, 203 by 101 and so on ultimately it is uh, 799 divided by 399 and this will be greater than or equals to uh, 101 sorry 201 by 101 201 by 101 plus 203 by 102 and so on till this will be 799 divided by 400. If you see all of these numbers are just greater than 2 and all of these numbers are just smaller than 2. And how many numbers are these? There are 400 numbers. So, sorry, there are uh, from 100 to 399, there are 300 numbers. So, my right hand side is just, uh, you know, close to 300 times 2, which is 600. And so is my left hand side. 300 times 2, which is my, how much? 600 again. Uh, not precisely, this is less than 600. This expression is less than 600. And this expression is greater than 600. If you call them S1 and S3, then the inequality is like that my uh, S1 is greater than 600, okay? S1 is, sorry, smaller than 600. S1 is smaller than 600 and S2 is definitely greater than 600. So my S is lying between these two numbers. So S must be near 600. So this is my option number C. All right, though to ideally prove that S, even S is above 600, you can use one more way to solve this is using uh, integral uh, as a approximation, approximation of integrals. Okay. Now, if you integrate uh, it from the left hand side, you will get the lower limit of the integral. Okay. Because it's an increasing function or decreasing function. Ideally, it's a decreasing function if you see. So, in a decreasing function, if you take the left hand side, it will be, you know, the upper limit. And if you take the right hand side, if you take the right hand side, you will get the lower limit. So let me draw the right hand side using yellow color. If I take the right hand side, you will get the lower limit of integral. Okay. 
so like that if you approximate again you will find that it is actually strictly greater than 600 slightly greater than 600 so and the options are again pretty far apart so we can say with confidence that the largest positive integer not exceeding this s will be 600 so next one is a really good question of limit as a sum you can see n is going to infinity along with uh, we'll even use uh, we will even take the help of integral in this. So, first of all, let me write this as a sum. What is this sum of? This is sigma uh, r times log of r, where r varies from 2 to n, uh, divided by n square log of n, and limit n tends to infinity. We will come to this n tends to infinity a little bit later. Let us imagine a function. What function can we imagine? We can practically imagine the function x log of x now if we find out the nature of this function we will find that my f dash of x is equals to uh, 1 plus log of x which is greater than 0 means the nature of the function is increasing so if i draw the increasing graph okay and if i approximate this summation as area under the curve by taking r equals to 2 or r equals to 3 or r equals to 4 then what will happen is and if we go all the way till n suppose this is 2 3 4 and n then this integral will definitely be less than the area okay uh, so if you talk about the integral uh, it will definitely be less than this integral and if you talk about the other one what other one suppose if you take the interval from pre suppose 1 okay suppose you take the value of the function at 1 and this will be my log 1 then log 2 so if you take the height as a pre interval which is 1 uh, then it will lie below the curve and if you take the height of 2 if you take the height at 1 it will be below the curve and if you take the height as next one it will be above the curve so it will be above the curve as you can see from this so my integral from x log of x okay from what interval to what interval let me just say that uh, in one case it is simply uh, 1 to n uh, okay integral from 1 to n x log x dx okay what about this integral if you are taking from 1 to n if we are taking the integral from 1 to n, this will be lesser than this summation. So we can say it will be lesser than the summation, uh, the desired summation which is there in the numerator. And if I take the integral from 2 to n plus 1, it will be greater than this summation. The integral is the same. What is the integral? The integral is uh, limit uh, integral basically is x log x dx. So it will be x. Uh, now my function will just be x plus 1 log of x plus 1. No, because I have already taken x plus 1 here. Let me keep the function as x log x. I cannot do both. x log x dx. Alright. Now if I divide all of this by n square log n and let n go to infinity, this will be n square log of n. This will also be n square log of n. I can practically find this integral using integration by parts. So let me find this integral now. Now that the role of approximation is over, let me remove this and this graph. If Even if I find one of these integrals x log x, it will be, if I take this as second function, this as func first function, it will be x square by 2. Log of x minus, it will be x square by 2 times 1 by x integral dx. And this will again be how much? Uh, x square by 4. So x square by 2 log of x minus x square by 4 is the indefinite integral if you put the limit 1 by n or 2 to n plus 1 you'll get the other limit also so my desired integral let me write this on the different note let me write this also in here so what we can say now is that my desired sum including limit uh, limit n tends to infinity s is less than uh, 
if I just put once n and once one in this expression, what will I get is n square by two log of n minus n square by four. And if I substitute one, this minus log of one will go to zero and plus one by four we will get plus one by four and whole divided by log of n times n square limit n tends to infinity. And on the upper end side, it will be n plus one the whole square log of n plus one. All right. n plus one the whole square log of n plus one uh, minus n plus one the whole square. Now this divided by two will be there and this divided by four will be there. And if you put two, you will get few more constant. But that constant divided by this huge quantity limit near limit n tends to infinity will get to zero. So let me not even mention that constant that prominently. Let me just substitute limit n tends to infinity whole divided by n square log of Now the left hand limit, you can see that this n square by four divided by n square log n will go to zero because n square and n square will cancel and one by log n as n goes to infinity will go to zero. And this limit will be half n square by two uh, log n divided by n square by log n will go to half. So my half is less than equals to l is uh, less than. What about this limit? Again, if you look at infinity by infinity limits, limit n tends to be log of n plus n, n plus one divided by log n is also one, and n plus one. Whole square by two whole divided by n square is also half. So overall, this is also half. So using sandwich theorem, we can say that this this limit will be equals to half. All right. Next is the set of all real numbers x for which three raised to the power two raised to the power one minus x square is an integer. Now the common mistake that students do in this question is they just assume that for this to be an integer, this whole power also needs to be an integer, which is not the case basically. Because if you talk about range of one minus x squared, it belongs from minus infinity to one closed, and uh, because we are talking about powers of two, two raised to the power one minus x squared will belong from two raised to the power minus infinity, which is how much? Uh, zero open, and two raised to the power one is two closed. And if you talk about three raised to the power two raised to the power one minus x squared, it will belong from three power zero is one, and three squared is nine. It will belong from zero uh, one to nine. Now we need to check what are all the integers possible in the range of one to nine. You will find that the all possible integers are two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. And not just suppose if someone assume that suppose when is x one minus x square a positive integer, then you will only get three values x is equals to zero or one minus one, and three is also there in the first option, which is very which would be wrong. Uh, suppose if I put three raised to the power two raised to the power one minus x square as any of these numbers. Suppose three power two power one minus x square equals to two. Using log two raised to the power one minus x square will become log of two base three, and then one minus x square will become log base two log base three two, and my x will become plus minus under root of one minus log base two log base three. You will find that it's a very much valid number. This is less than one, so this will also be less than one. Uh, this is uh, less than one greater than zero, so this will be a negative number. So overall, it will be a real number basically. Only real number is going in the square root. So even though they are looking complicated, exactly if you replace this two with this three, or four, or five, or six, or seven, or eight, we'll keep getting different different values of x. How many is two values of each for each of these? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven times two, that is fourteen values. Now, what if this is equals to nine? If three raised to the power two raised to the power one minus x square is equals to three square, then my two raised to the power one minus x square will become equals to two. So one minus x square will become equals to one. So x will become equals to zero. We will only get one solution, but just nine, and we'll get two solutions each from the remaining seven values. So overall, fourteen plus one, we will have fifteen solutions, which is option number D. All right. Next one is let n strictly greater than one. And we arrange this in the decreasing powers of x. Then suppose the first three coefficients are in a. What will be the first coefficient? By the way, it will be one. What will be the second coefficient? N c one into half. And what will be the third coefficient? N c two times one by two square. Okay. So these are one n by two and n into n minus one divided by a. They are in a. That means two times middle term will be equal to first term plus uh, third term. So if we rearrange this quadratic, this is n square minus nine n plus eight equals to zero. So I'm getting two values of n, n equals to one or n equals to eight. 
but clearly n is strictly greater than 1 of course it cannot be equals to 1 otherwise you won't get 3 terms in the binomial expansion so n has to be 8 n is equals to 8 and now we want to know which terms has integer powers so if you write the general term of this expression the general term t of n plus 1 or t of r plus 1 is going to be 8 c r because my n is 8 x raised to the power 8 minus r divided by 2 times 1 by 2 x raised to the power uh, 1 by 4 whole raised to the power r. If you combine the total powers of x it is 8 minus r by 2 minus r by 4 so this is x power a to the 16 minus and r plus 2r will be 3r divided by 4. So for the power of x to be integer minus 16 minus 3r by 4 must be an integer where my r is an integer uh, belonging to 0, 1, 2 and so on till 8. So suppose you put r equals to 0 then you will get an integer. If you put r equals to 4 then you will get the next integer and if you put r equals to 8 then you will get the next integer. So the only three possible values of r are going to be among these 0, 4 and 8 for which we will get an integer power. So we have three terms with integer powers of x. Alright, next one is consider the points of the form n, comma n power k which strictly lie inside a circle of radius 10 centered at origin. Alright. So the given region can be described as x square plus y square is strictly less than 100. Let me write it as we need to find the points in the region x square plus y square is strictly less than 100. And if you replace x with n and y with n power k you will get n power k plus n power 2k is less than 100 and the point is this n comma n power k. Now because n is a whole number, okay, n and k are integers, n is greater than equals to 0. So let me start with n equals to 0. If I have n equals to 0, then any n raised to the power k will also be 0. So one of the points will be 0 comma 0 which is origin. Uh, also if we find the next number, suppose n is equals to 1, then 1 power k is also 1. So we get the next point which is 1 comma 1. Suppose we get n equals to 2. Now 2 raised to the power 1 is 2. So the point will be 2 comma 2. 2 square will be equals to 4. And if you consider the point 2 comma 4, you will notice that 2 square plus 4 square is less than 100. So this is also inside. If you consider the next point 2 comma 8, then that is also inside. 8 is the 64 plus 4 is how much? Uh, 64 plus 4 is 68. It's still less than 100 but if you take the next higher power 2 comma 16 then 16 square will exceed 100 so we don't want the next higher power of 2 so how many points did we get so far 1 2 3 4 5 next we put to n equals to 3 then we get one of the pairs 3 comma 3 which is of course lying in this interval what about 3 comma 9 uh, 9 9 is 81 plus 9 is 90 so it is still less than 100 but as you can see obviously the next higher power will exceed 100 so we don't want to go there n equals to 4 we will get 4 comma 4 and 4 comma uh, 16 will definitely out of the question because this will exceed 100. Next is my 5 comma 5 which is 25 plus 25 which is 50 very well within the bounds cannot take higher powers. 6 comma 6 36 plus 36 is 72 7 comma 7 49 plus 49 is 98. Now we cannot get any further because if you take 8 comma 8 then 64 plus 64 is 128 which is clearly greater than 100. So we have how many points so far? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. We have these 11 points satisfying all the given conditions. Alright, next is an interesting bit of question. So based on number theory, they are saying that if p square plus q square plus 7 p q is a perfect square, let us say that perfect square is n square. Then let us make the perfect square on left hand side. So you, if you single out p square plus q square plus 2pq, p square plus q square plus 2pq, what will remain as an extra? 5pq will remain as an extra and on the right hand side we have n square. Now uh, let me rearrange the terms. This is p plus q whole square and let me take that on the other side. So what we have is n square minus p plus q the whole square is equals to 5p. So the factors are n plus p plus q times n minus p minus q is equals to 5p. Now what has been given about p and q is p is less than q and they are prime numbers. 
So what are all the different possibilities for these? This can be factorized in several ways. And if we consider n plus p plus q to be the bigger factor and n minus p minus q be the bigger factors, one of the factoring could be this is 5 pq and this is 1. Another factoring could be suppose that this is pq and this is 5. Another factoring could be that this is 5q, this is p. Another factoring is this could be 5p and this could be q. Now, if I add or subtract both of these terms, I don't want this n. I only want the relation p and q. So let me subtract these two. So if I subtract these two, I'll get 2 times p plus q is equals to one of the relations could be 5pq minus 1 or another relation could be pq minus 5 or another relation could be 5q minus p or another relation could be 5p minus q. Now let us try each of these relations one by one. If I try the first relation and try to find q in terms of p, I will get q as, uh, what will be q? 5p minus 2 and in the numerator we will have 2p plus 1 upon 5p minus q. You will notice that the denominator is clearly bigger than, uh, this is 5p minus 1. Uh, 5p minus 2 basically. Q is 5p minus 2. Correct. The numerator is clearly bigger than the denominator. So Q will never be an integer. This is clearly rejected. So the other possibility is that from the second expression, my Q could be how much? My Q could be this time uh, 2p plus 5 divided by uh, Q, sorry, divided by p minus 2. Now if I want to have a my, uh, p minus 2 in the numerator, you can subtract a 4 and add a 4. So it will become this divided by p minus 2. So this will become 2 plus 9 divided by p minus 2. Now, what are the factors of 9? They are 1, 3 and 9. And if you uh, want to maximize it, the factor needs to be the minimum, which is 1. And if you put p minus 2 equals to 1, you get p equals to 3, which is a prime. And q, you will get 11 from here. So one of the values of q that I get is 11. Let's continue exploring. Let us talk about the other things. If you say 2p plus q is 5q minus p, then p and q won't remain as prime. And if you again put 2p plus q is equals to 5p minus q, then again p and q won't remain as prime. So these two are rejected. First one is rejected. This is the only possibility and the largest value of p and q that we were able to get. The smallest p was 3 and the largest q was 11. So the answer for largest possible value of q is 11. All right. Next is a geometry based question. So in this figure, uh, this DE by AB is X. So suppose if I assume AB as X, then this DB is 2X. And suppose if I assume the radius as R, then M1 my CF will be equals to R. This is of course a right angle. Then what about CD? CD will actually be R minus 2X because my C is also R. And what about CV? My CV will be equals to R minus X. This will be R minus 2X and this will be R minus X. Now I want to find the ratio Fe by Fe. So if I calculate Fe using Pythagoras theorem, this distance is again because of rectangle R minus X and this distance is 2X. So my F is root of 2X the whole square plus R minus X the whole square. So this is how much? This is the square root of 4X square plus X square is 5X square minus 2RX plus how much? This is uh, R square. Similarly, if I calculate my uh, AF or FA rather, FA will be root of this square plus this square. This is nothing but X since this is R minus 2X. So it will be X square plus R minus 2X the whole square. This will turn out to be again 5X square minus 2 to the 4RX this time and again plus R square. Now what other relations do you have between this and this? So you can say that this is R minus 2X, this is r minus x. So one more relation is r minus 2x the whole square plus r minus x the whole square is equals to r square. So from here what I have is 5x square plus r square is equals to how much? 2 to the 4 plus 1, 5x r. If I substitute that in this one and this one, my ratio Fe by Fe will become equals to root of 5x square plus r square is 5x r. So 5x r minus 2x r in the numerator divided by in the denominator, what we have again is 5xr. Okay, this is 4xr and this is 2xr. Actually, this will be 6xr. Uh, 4 plus 2, it will be 6. 6xr minus 2xr. And what will be in the denominator? We will have uh, 6xr minus 4xr. So, we'll have 
4 divided by 2 that is root of 2, square root of 2 which is my option number B. Simple geometry you can do it. Alright, next question is uh, based upon something called the integral test of convergence. So if I uh, know that this integral converges and I have a series, what is that series? If I look at different different series, then the series C is sigma k equals to 1 to infinity. e raised to the power k upon b of e raised to the power k is there. Let me consider f of x as some e raised to the power x upon b of e raised to the power x. Now I want to know whether this series converges or diverges. Okay. Then what I'll do is I'll try to find integral of fx dx. So what will that be? That will be integral of e raised to the power x dx from 1 to infinity, from 1 to infinity, whole divided by uh, b of e raised to the power x. Now here if I make the substitution, e raised to the power x is equals to t, then my integral 1 to infinity will actually convert from, uh, you can say, e raised to the power, and my e raised to the power x dx will become dt. So it will become from e to infinity, dt upon v of e raised to the power t. Well, one can safely assume that if 1 to infinity, this diver, uh, converges, then e to infinity, this will definitely uh, converge. Because this is less than integral from 1 to infinity. Because it's a positive function, because its codomain is from 1 to infinity. Its range will also be from 1 to infinity only. So if 1 to infinity converges, then e to infinity will also converge. d of t upon b of e raised to the power t. And because this is infinity, we can say that this will also be this is less than infinity means this doesn't diverge means this converges means this smaller function will also converge for sure. So the correct answer is option number C. You can see that none of the other functions you can make it like in this form. If you try any of the other functions you will never be able to make it in this form. Alright. Uh, next is if you observe what is the relation between 1 minus y by epsilon and 1 plus epsilon and 1 minus epsilon. What I can do is I can try one of the substitutions. What I can substitute is 1 minus y is equals to t. Then what will happen is uh, if I substitute uh, 1 plus e as y then it will become minus epsilon and this will become plus epsilon. And there is a divide by L so, uh, epsilon also. So if I go one step further and write 1 minus y by epsilon as t then as y equals to 1 plus epsilon then my t will be equals to minus 1 and when y is equals to 1 minus epsilon then t will be equals to 1. And what will be the relation between dt and dy? dt will be equals to minus dy by epsilon. So how will the integral converge and by the way what will be my y then y will become 1 minus epsilon t. So my this limit will become limit epsilon tends to 0. Well this 1 upon epsilon times dy will become minus of dt so I will have integral of minus of f of 1 minus epsilon t times psi of t dt where the limits of the integral are from 1 to minus 1. Now using properties of definite integral if we switch the limits then this minus sign will be taken care of so this whole thing is limit epsilon uh, tends to 0 from minus 1 to 1 f of 1 minus epsilon t psi of t dt. Now if you look at this closely, uh, epsilon is only remaining in this expression. Thus we have removed epsilon even from the limits and from here and from here. We have removed epsilon from these three places. And because t lies between minus 1 to 1, we can safely say that if you multiply that by something going to 0, something tending to 0 times something lying between minus 1 to 1, it will definitely be equals to 0. So this is simply f of 1. And this f1 constant we can take it outside. This is simply f of 1 times and now we don't need the limit anymore. This is simply minus 1 to 1 psi of t dt. But the good news is if you just change the name of the variable, this will be the same as f of 1 times integral from minus 1 to 1 psi of uh, x dx. And you will see that this is given as 1. So my final answer is simply f of 1, which is option number A. So this is a good question of using properties of definite integral as well as applying limits in the integral and being comfortable with it. Alright, next is let A, B, C be three complex numbers, then when will this equation represent the equation of straight line? Now we know that this represents the equation of straight line. What is the equation of straight line? Typically it is something like A, Z or rather A, Z conjugate plus A conjugate Z plus B equals to 0 where 
A and Z are complex numbers and B is a real number. If I want to make it similar to this, first of all, I want, don't want a complex number it in the place of C. I want a real number. So how can I make that? I can divide by a C. So if I divide it by a C, I'll get A by C times Z plus B by C times Z conjugate plus 1 equals to C. Now one more thing that needs to happen is these two numbers must be conjugate of each other for it to represent a straight line. So I can either say that A by C is equals to B by C whole conjugate which using which I can say that A C conjugate is equals to C B conjugate or alternatively you can say that A by C whole conjugate is equals to B by C. So you can say A conjugate C is equals to B C conjugate. In both the options uh, this uh, a conjugate C is equals to B C conjugate is given. So this is there in option number B and option number D. But one more thing that needs to happen is that if these are similar, then what about the magnitudes? Then the magnitudes, if I take both of the magnitudes, then magnitude of A by C must be equal to magnitude of B conjugate by C conjugate. Well, magnitude of C and C conjugate is the same. So we can directly say that magnitude of A is equal to magnitude of B conjugate is equal to magnitude of B. And none of them can be zero, otherwise we have a problem, we won't even have a straight line to look for. So magnitude of A must be equal to magnitude of B and A conjugate C must be equal to B conjugate C. Then and only then we can say with surety that it will be a straight line. Uh, neither B and C are uh, sufficient in their own right, so that's why D has to be the correct answer. And this last question is, we have two statements and we have to check the correctness of each of the following statements. Now, first one states that g of x cube plus x power 5 is e raised to the power x minus 100. And domain is R, codomain is R. Can it be a differentiable function? Suppose this is differentiable and let us differentiate. So if we differentiate, we'll get g dash of x cube plus x power 5 times using chain rule 3x square plus 5x power 4. And on the right hand side, what do we have is uh, e raised to the power x1. Now if I substitute x equals to 0 in here, on the left hand side we will get a 0 and on the right hand side we will get a 1, which is a contradiction. That means at 0 it will definitely not be differentiable. That means it, it's uh, the first statement is false. The first statement is not correct. Similarly, if you talk about a continuous function from all real numbers to all real numbers, g of e raised to the power x is equals to x cube plus x power 5. Suppose if I put e raised to the power x as t, then my x will be equals to ln of t. So if I put ln t, I'll get g of t is equals to ln t whole cube plus ln t whole power 5. The only problem with this is t belongs to r positive. But here the in argument of domain is given as r. And you know for a function to be well defined, we cannot leave any of the elements of the domain outside. But for negative real numbers or zero, we have a problem. So it will, uh, no function, no such continuous function can exist from all real numbers. This small thing is creating problems. So even a statement two is not true. So both uh, one and two are incorrect or neither one or neither two is correct. So that is my correct answer. Uh, well, these are the solution of all the questions. And uh, this was the solution of UGA uh, 2024. Uh, Please uh, follow this channel for more such content and in the comments let us know what kind of content would you like to see next.